Snap Judgment Studios. Snap Judgment is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Everyone wants a certain outcome. You want people to respond to this matrix of activity in certain ways that work to our benefit. You want the beautiful woman to see you pull the puppy from the well. You want your boss to walk in while the client showers you with the praise. And by cleverly manipulating the things within our control, we may even be able to engineer the outcome we desire. And today, on a very special snap judgment. I've got two stories, I've got one problem. It's simple. How do we make someone do the right thing? Snap Judgment Live, the social experiment. We begin with a treat. Someone brand new to the Snap Judgment Live stage steps up to claim this hollow microphone. Is he up for the task? Yes, I have saved you the very best seat in the house. Dino Archie, Snap Judgment Live. Sensitive listeners should note this story does contain raw language. As such, listener discretion is advised. We like this young brother, and I know that you will too. Please give it up for Dino Archie. Oh man, give it up for the uh, the acts you've seen so far, man. Don Reed, Glenn, the band. Yeah. I like Portland so far, man. I've seen like eight signs, like storefronts that say Black Lives Matter is for black people here. That's just considerate. You're just like, just in case, just in case some of you guys come, you do matter. <laughs> Very woke city here. <laughs> I am. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm in, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> I'm in a long, I'm in a long distance relationship, and uh, Netflix is keeping us together. It is, right? You watch a show, you know, that's what you do. You watch a show together and you bond, you know. But the only way you can mess it up is if you watch the next episode without her. It's worse than cheating, man. I was. I was in Dubai, and then, uh, you know, I was, it was the end of the finale of Game of Thrones, and I was like, I, yeah, I said, I'm watching it, man. We're, I'm 12 hours ahead, I'm cheating. And it felt like cheating, too. I, like, I, laid, I had rose petals on the bed. <laughs> right, I had the laptop out. And, and I was like, oh, cool, and I, play, I put it on, and then I played it, and then, uh, then my girl called me, and I was like, damn, and I, I, slapped, I slammed the, the laptop down. But and I go, what's up, babe? And then, but the lap, I had an old, I have an old laptop, so the sound kept playing. <laughs> right? She was like, "Who is that in the background? Is that Khaleesi?" And I, <laughs> right? I just lied. I was like, "Nah, that's some chick I met at the club tonight." <laughs> she was like, "Okay, I'm going back to sleep." She didn't care. I uh, no, nah, I'm in a, no, you, you, it's true. I'm, I'm in a relationship. I'm committed, and it's, 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 it's weird because I could only in a long distance relationship. You're not in the same city, so it's like, I feel like a young widow or something, like a widower. Like, you know what I mean? I go to farmer's markets by myself. 
right? I'll see a funny piece of fruit, you know, and I'll forget she's not. We all go, babe, look at dog. Oh. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's lonely. And then, so you could only meet, you could only meet new guy friends. You can't meet new girlfriends. That's against the rule. It's frowned upon. You right? So you could only meet new guy friends. And in, in your 30s, meeting a new guy friend is way more intimate because there is no sex involved. You're looking for a soulmate. <laughs> You know what I mean? You're like, you like baseball, I like baseball. Let's be friends forever. Like, let's, <laughs> let's do this. And my girl knows, too, when I've... She knows when I've met somebody that's special. <laughs> right? She'll be like... Right? She can hear it in my voice. I'll call her. I'm like... Uh, she goes, how's your day? I'm like, it's, it's good. It's pretty good. Right? She goes, who is he? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> We, when guys, if you, women don't know this, we give each other, when we got a good friend, we give each other like nickname, like, you know, good nickname. I got a, a friend, like my best friend's name is Sweetfoot, <laughs> right? That, I've never called my girl Sweetfoot. That's <laughs> such an intimate name, but, but <laughs> Sweetfoot, but he, he, he earned that name. He earned that name. And this is the story how he earned that name. I remember, in fact, the first day that I met, that I met him. Um, I moved to Canada. It's, my, it's like I'm there in town for a week. I'm doing comedy at this bar. I met this African dude, first black dude I met in town. So I was like, what's up? And, and let's, let's hang out. And he's, I think he used to boost purses, like something like that. And he was a shady promoter. So he goes, come do this show. I go to this bar and I do the show. After the show, the bartender, you know, I meet him and that's his, his name is Chris. You know, I was like, oh, what's he looked like Chris uh, Harrison from The Bachelor. The host, he looked like that, like a guy you could trust. He had kind eyes. So I see him and I'm like, okay, cool, this dude's cool. But then we end up getting into this bar fight, not with each other. We, it was these two, two patrons there. They were two like, they were like evil hippies. They were weird, they had bad auras, you know? <laughs> right, one dude kept trying to show everybody his crystal. You know that kind of guy, like, look at my crystal. You're like, this guy's gonna be a problem, you know? And so we, we looked at each other at the end of the bar and we both knew, like, hey, man, if some goes down, we, we got it, right? I don't even, this is my first day there, but I'm like, it's, and of course, the went down. They jumped this lady, the, the couple, they jump on this lady, and then we, my buddy Chris, he jumps in to break it up, right? And he says something, he goes, he grabs the guy, he goes, all right, that's it, buddy. Because white, white dudes, before they fight, they always say something cool. So I thought that was cool. He goes, that's it, you're out. He goes, you're done, that's what he said. So he grabs the dude, and so I, I grabbed the girl because I was like, that's better for me because I don't, I don't work here. I'm not a hero. I'm not insured. I'm just gonna grab her. But she was tougher than dude. She scratched me, so I screamed like, ah, like that. Right, and then, and then I, <laughs> so we, he throws the guy out and I throw her out. But I forgot, I don't know how to throw someone out, but so I went to my, I used to do track. So I used to do shot put. So I went to, right, I had technique. So I, right, overshot it, she flies out. We locked the door behind us like, oh my God. That really escalated. You know what I mean? You bond, that was our first meet, you bond, right? We're, we're having drinks, you know? And, 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 you know, and he, at the end of the night, I go, how much? He goes, oh, it's on the house. I was like, man, this is a good guy a good dude you know we exchange numbers you know then the next day that's when it gets awkward right because when you meet somebody you like you're like man do i text him today or <laughs> you know what i mean what do i say and then i was like okay forget I, i'm lonely i'm new in town like i'm just gonna you know so i go hey uh it's me man do you know remember the, the girl who screamed <laughs> and i was like why'd you say that i was so stupid <laughs> You know, then you walk away from the phone because you don't even want to see, but then you peek back at it. And then like, I saw those, lot, those dots when you see the, that they're texting. You know, I was like, ooh, I got butterflies, it's cool. And then, so then he texts back and he's like, oh yeah, bud. You know, he's Canadian, he's like, yeah, bud, that was hilarious. That girl screamed, I was like, oh, it was me, but he didn't know it. And, uh, <laughs> and he goes, what are you doing this weekend? I didn't want to seem too available, you know? So I was like, I got a couple things going on. Why, what's up? He goes, uh, I'm gonna go to my cabin, man. It's, uh, it's on Pender Island, I'm gonna go, man. And uh, if you, you know, why don't you come with me? I got a little boat, we can take the boat over there. 
You know, and I was just like, yeah, why not? You know, I'll do that. You know, it sounds nice. <laughs> and <laughs> he said, yeah, we could go crab trapping. I was like, I don't even know what the hell that is. That sounds like some white people fun. That sounds fun. <laughs> crab trapping, that sounds amazing. And, you know, so what he meant was, so we take the phone, what he meant was, it's other people that they put a, 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 they put a crab trap at the bottom of the ocean and they have, and then, so what, we didn't have one, we just, we poached. We took their, oh, was, yeah! So we're poaching crab? Like, we turned into full pirates. It was the best. I was like, I'm the captain, ha ah, ha, yeah, find one. And, right, and we go to the cabin and we were eating crab and then the whales came by, we were whale watching. It was romantic, you know what I mean? But without the sex, it was dope. And, Right, I, 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 right. I was, I even called my mom. I was like, "What's up?" She's like, "Who is he?" You know, and I was like, "Man, he's good. He's good. He's a good guy." His name. Is... So we start calling him Goodfoot. Right? I was like, "He's," and I'm, I introduced to my roommate, and then from then on, every day we were at the bar. We were at his bar. It was like, it was like Cheers. That was my favorite show as a kid, because I was like, when I grow up, I want to do that. But it, it was no black people in Cheers. It was Boston, and. So we were like Norman Phil, me and my roommate. We ran up a tab, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. Goodfoot doesn't give a just, just a friend. We're just, every day we're hanging out. You know, and then he bought a, another bar, right? And then we stopped seeing him so much. He was, you know, he couldn't hang out anymore. He was a little stressed. It was weird, man. He, and then he changed a little bit. And, and it got really weird when he, when he texted me and he goes, hey man, um, I'm gonna need you to pay that tab. And I was like, whoa, who is this? <laughs> it, what you've done with Goodfoot, you know what I mean? Like, he wouldn't make me do that, this is weird. Right, and he, then he calls me, and, and, and I was like, what's up, man, I don't have your money. And he goes, nah, it's not about that, man, I need, to, I need to talk to you, man, can you meet up? I said, yeah, for sure, this is sound serious. He goes, yeah, uh, meet me at Bimini's. So I meet him at this bar, Bimini's. It's, now, this bar is well lit but he's in the back and somehow he's in the shade. He has his own shade. You know what I mean? I think he had a trench coat on, but he didn't, but it seemed like he did. And he was smoking a cigarette, even though he didn't smoke. Right, I couldn't see his eyes no more. They were dark and I was like, what's... So I go there, I sit down, I go, what's happening, man? What's shaking? And he said, man, uh, I know I've been acting a little different lately. I just been hella stressed, man. I'm, I'm in debt over my head. I took on this, these bars, I'm not making no money. My staff, they're making all the money and, and you know how bad they are. He had a terrible staff, real clumsy, real clumsy staff. And I was like, I feel you, man. I didn't know it was that bad. He goes, I, I can't do it no more, man. I wanna, I'm done. I wanna be out of the business. I wanna be free like you. And I was like, hell yeah, man. I don't got no responsibilities. I was like, man, be, yeah, be like me. We'll be like Tom Hanks and Big, man. Like, right? I was like, yeah, we'll never get old, even though we're almost 40, you know, like. I said, cool, I'm down, man. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna sell the businesses? And he goes, nah, man. I said, oh, I get it. You're gonna burn them, collect the insurance money. He goes, no, 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 I'm just leaving, man. I'm done, I'm gonna let the bank take care of it. Just, you know, file bankruptcy. I go, oh, like our leader, perfect. And <laughs> you can do that, that's an option. <laughs> so I said, cool, then yeah, I'm on board. I'm on your team, this sounds great. All green lights. Then he hits me, He's, this is a kicker. He goes, uh, you know, my, my, what I called you over here for was, my dilemma is do I pay the staff their last two weeks or do I keep the money and start my new life, right? And I was like, inside I was like, my friend's a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Right, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh my God, like inside I say that, but outside I didn't wanna, it, you know, he trusted me with this bad guy information. Right, what, well, that's a monster thing to do. And I, I don't say, I go, how much are we talking? That's a fair question. <laughs> don't act all sadiddy like that. <laughs> oh, everybody here is just a good guy. Everyone here found some money on the ground, like, oh, you forgot your wallet, not everybody does that. Maybe if you're doing good that month, you will. But if you've been doing bad, you might consider it, right? You'd be like, hey, hey, this is a blessing, you know, and just walk off, I don't know. So I said, how much are we talking? And he said, eight, it, like he cut me off, he goes, 18,243 bucks. Yeah, he had an exact number, <laughs> right? And I was like, oh, 
this is the number my friend would kill somebody for. Like, that's that number, right? You know what I mean? And, I, and, and which is high. 18, 2, 4, 3, that's high. That's not a low number, right? Like, I, I, I'm from, not in my town, I'm from Fresno. Like, you could hire somebody for 400 bucks to kill someone. They won't get the job done. <laughs> They'll try, though. They'll inconvenience you a little bit. 18, 2, 4, 3, that's a tall number. What do you say to that? This is your friend. What do you say to that? Right? I feel where he's at. But the thing was, I know him. He's a good dude. This is good for him. He's a good guy. And I know he's tripping right now. But the only thing I can think because it was Christmas was next in a week. So I go, but what about Christmas? That's what I said. Dead eye. He looked at me. He goes, I don't believe in Christmas. Dino's not done yet. Keep it locked because Snap Judgment, live. The social experiment continues in just a moment. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment Live, the social experiment. Now, right before the break, Dino Archie had left us on the good foot. Listen to discretion. He's advised. Then he hits me. He's, this is the kicker. He goes, uh, my dilemma is, do I pay the staff their last two weeks or do I keep the money and start my new life. I know he's tripping right now, but the only thing I can think, because it was Christmas was next in a week. So I go, but what about Christmas? That's what I said. Dead eye, he looked at me, he goes, I don't believe in Christmas. <laughs> Anymore, I was like, oh, he's too far gone. He's gone. He's gone, man. And, and, and I leave, you know, it was heavy. I leave, I'm driving around the city for like two days I couldn't think about nothing else but that because I know the staff man every, t- every time I would drive by the bar it was like I felt like the ghost of Christmas future like I knew what fate awaited them you know I would look at I point at the bar with a shaky hand like oh, you are all cursed it was too heavy to keep to myself right so I go home my roommate Kyle I tell him about it so we I'm like, dude, man, this is good for it's gonna, he's gonna become a full bad guy, man. I don't know what to do. We needed, we smoked a copious amount of marijuana, put our heads together, <laughs> try to figure it out. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. He goes, he goes, you gotta save Christmas. Right? And I go, but how? He goes, I don't know. You gotta figure it out. Right? And, I, and I'm supposed to head out of town in two days to go do his show. And I go, oh, okay, I got it, man. I, I, I got it just, he needs a pep talk because he's down right now. He's just a little down, man. He needs a reminder that, that, that it'll get better. And, and I go, he needs a speech. So I had a speech ready. So the next day, on the way to the airport, I call him. I go, hey, man, are you at the bar? He goes, yeah. I said, stay there. I'm on my way. And then I just, I'm speeding for no reason. Running red lights, like, right, right. And I'm driving. And I get there and I go, hey, man, I got to tell you, man. I can't let you do this. He goes, do what? I, I said, I can't, I, I can't let you ruin Christmas for these people, man. I said, you got to pay them, man. I said, you, right now, you're just a little bit down. And, and then the speech kicked in. So this is the first time I've ever given a speech. So I said, a week ago, you were out of gas. This is a true story. He was out of gas. I said, you were at the bottom of a hill, dead of traffic. Everybody hated you. And then you know who you called? You called me. Right, and you said, hey, Dino, man, I need your help. I said, what's up? He said, I'm, I'm out of gas. I'm at the bottom of this hill. And I was on a Tinder date at that time. <laughs> but you know what I did? I said, hey, babe, we got to make a stop. Because it's my boy. He's in trouble. He's at the bottom of the hill. 
So I got the gas. I'd never been able to help you. I had 10 bucks. I got the gas. I go over there and I gas you up. And you, and you know what? You got back up to, to the top of the hill. And, and he's looking at me like, okay. And I go, so right now you're at the bottom of the hill emotionally in here. So right here. I'm in my Oscar bag. I'm in my, this is my Daniel Day Lewis. This is my Denzel. I'm like, hey, you down right here. You're at the bottom, I said, and I'm here to gas you up emotionally. I'm riffing, I'm riffing. And I said, I can't let you do this. I know, I know them, you're, you've got a clumsy staff. I know they're not the best, but you don't want to be that owner. They'll always remember you for ruining Christmas. You don't want to do this, man. And then he, he looked at me, he goes, it's too late. And I, I don't believe in Christmas, I told you. He walks off. All hope was lost. I'm late to my flight, I gotta go. Right, I leave. And everything was a little different. That, even from the moment I left, that winter got a little colder, right? The colors weren't as bright. You know, the, the, the best guy I knew was actually, turned out just to be a regular monster, you know? I, I knew he was better than me, at least I thought, but, you know, he wasn't. So, I was sad, I did my show. I was funny, but I wasn't there, you know? Cause I was just like, the only good guy I know ain't so good. I go back to my hotel, I left my phone there. I go back, it's a bunch of text messages from, from Chris. I don't even call him Goodfoot at this point. I'm like, you're just Chris, a regular human. What does Chris want? Chris the regular human. And he's like, call me. Call me, call me ASAP, call me, man, you gotta call me. So I call him up, I go, what's up, Chris? And he goes, dude, are you back? When are you back? Are you back Monday? I go, nah, I'm back Tuesday. He goes, damn, man, you're gonna miss it. I said, miss what? He goes, the party. He goes, I'm having a big party. Everybody's getting paid. Christmas is back on. I'm not going out like that. And I was like, what, you're, you're back? He goes, I'm back, baby. I said, was it the speech? <laughs> right? And he goes, no, that speech was terrible. He goes, but you did gas me up, man. You saved Christmas. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, man. I was like, this is the best comeback since Jordan, game six. 96, baby. I said, I'm gonna miss the party, but Christmas is on. This is amazing. Dope, man. All right, so cool, man. I'll see you when I can go. See me when you get back. I said, cool, and I fly back in. And I heard about the party. My roommate couldn't wait to tell me. It was epic. He goes, oh, dude, you missed it, man. It was the party of the century. People were pouring their own drinks. I was cooking in the back. He goes, that's against code. That's not regulation. He was like, man, people were just throwing, he was throwing tabs in the air. They called the cops. Somebody called the cops. They came, they got drunk. They tased the guy. Consensually, it was the best. Everybody's right. We didn't have to pay our tab. And I was like, oh my God, man. I said, good foot is back good again. And my buddy looked at me and he goes, nah, man. He ain't good foot no more. He's sweet foot. Thank you guys so much. Dino Archie. Dino Archie! Dino Archie, ladies and gentlemen, Dino Archie, back by the beach with the Snap Judgment Live Band Bells Atlas. Now, Dino, he just released a brand new album of comedic stories. It's called I've Changed. And it's available everywhere. Spotify, Apple Music, however you get your media, it's available there. And what you won't know by hearing his story, and I only know by being backstage with him, is that this guy has an actual six-pack. No plastic surgery, it's for real. The music was by the funky Bells Atlas. Get more funk in your life, bellsatlas.com. Next up, on the Snap Judgment Mind Game Social Experiment episode, he's been gone long enough. That's right. 
the closer himself is about to make his smashing return right after this break. Tell everybody to go away, but you can stay tuned. Back to Snap Judgment Live, the social experiment where we dive deep into someone else's psyche to get them to do our bidding. And yes, as promised, the spank swearing, the house coat having, the attitude sporting, ladies and gentlemen, it would not be unwelcome if you were to rise from your seats right now as we celebrate the return to the Snap Judgment stage. Oh, the closer. Now, this story does contain explicit language. Sensitive listeners are advised. Please put your hands together for Mr. James Judd. Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here. I've been saying, I've been saying, before the end of the world, I'm gonna play BAM, and I just made it! Yeah. This is completely off topic, this is not a uh, part of my story, but this has just been on my mind. What do you suppose that our second Civil War uniforms will look like? <laughs> I think it's gonna be very different. I don't think it's gonna be the red and the blue. I th I'm thinking more like cargo shorts and a cape. <laughs> you know, but you know, listen, the whole world is hanging by a thread. This is not the time to hold back. So without further ado, hit it. <laughs> San Jose, California, the late 70s. It is the summer after sixth grade. And I am really freaked out about starting junior high school because I am the class weirdo. I mean, I'm it. Uh, it's me. Do you remember the weirdest person in class? That was me. You wonder what happened to that person? I'm gonna tell you. That was me. And junior high school means there's eighth graders. I'm gonna get my ass kicked every day. You are so weird. Oh my God, you're so weird. Why are you so weird? You're like the biggest weirdo in school. Look, I get it. I, I get it. I'm, I'm the class weirdo. Look, if I could not be, I, I wouldn't be. I mean, I'd like to fit in, but I just don't. I mean, I try to be, you know, normal. I even have like a little ritual to sort of knock the weirdo out of me. Um, there's like a time uh, when I'm like home by myself for an hour every afternoon, and I go into my parents' bedroom with my miniature dogs and brownie, and my parents had this big, long credenza on one side of the room. And on one side of it, my mom has like three frosted wigs that she rotates throughout the week. And on the other side, there's some bottles of whiskey and a glass. And in the middle, there's a stereo with like some Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash and Buddy Rich records. And I pour myself a thin line of scotch. And I put on one of those frosted wigs. <laughs> And I put on that Buddy Rich record and I dance! <laughs> Did I get it? Did I knock it out of me? I don't know, but I feel great. <laughs> I, uh, okay, I have to tell you something. You're not gonna like it, <laughs> but here it goes. I too had a terrible father. Stay with me. <laughs> stay with me. Say, stay with me. 
Look, if we didn't all have terrible fathers, we wouldn't have a show. Yes. <laughs> Having at least one terrible parent gives you like a 90% increase in ending up in a one-person show. <laughs> this is so comfortable. <laughs> but if you're gonna end up at BAM, you better be living with a real monster, and I've got one. <laughs> An alcoholic, door-breaking monster. For my whole childhood, I had one dream, to be kidnapped. <laughs> I used to see other kids' pictures on milk cartons and think, what have they got that I haven't got? <laughs> Movies are my salvation. There's a, a movie theater in our town that has $2 Tuesday. And $2 gets you into a full day of second and third run movies and everyone who works there is 15 and stoned and they don't care if I'm 11 and I go to R-rated movies. So I get a can of tab from the concession and I, and I sit in the theater and I see all the great movies of the 70s. But the movie that changes everything for me is The Exorcist. Well, until then, who, who even knew that demonic possession was a thing? Not me. My parents come from different religions, and they decided sometime before I was born that the way to keep their kids from joining the other's religion was to have no religion at all. I mean, at age 11, I don't know anything about religion other than what I've seen in Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> which I've seen like a dozen times. And I believe every note. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. Should I bring him down? Should I scream and shout? Let my feelings out. Well, it was the early 70s. I mean, Jesus and Mary, Sonny and Cher, it was very easy to get them mixed up. And in my mind, Mary is always played by Cher. And every night, all the men will come around and lay the money down. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> I know nothing about religion. I see The Exorcist, and to me, this is a story about a girl not much older than myself who conquers her inner demons. And I think, well, this is it. This is the answer. If I can get a demon to possess me, I'm sure I can skip seventh grade. <laughs> I mean, how do you do that, you know? So I... Uh, well, first I try in a Ouija board, and that doesn't work. Even though I lit a sand candle and I put on linen Skinner, that's like known to bring demons. <laughs> then I think, well, maybe I'm thinking too small. Maybe if I could get the other kids in my neighborhood possessed by demons, it would catch on like the flu and the whole school would be shut down. Like, how do I do that? I remember that I got some old sock puppets from the garage. I think, I'll put on a puppet show. I'll put on an exorcist sock puppet show. Well, the next day I gather all the kids that I can get from the neighborhood into our living room. My parents are gone. They don't have any idea what's going on. And uh, I begin the show. Oh, Reagan, I'm the priest that's gonna help you shake loose the demon. <laughs> I'm not Reagan. I'm a devil. Grab her by the Ah! Ah, the devil, only the devil would say that. Ah. Well, I think the show goes great. <laughs> but no matter what anyone else says, I am telling you, I did not lock the front door to keep anybody from getting out. <laughs> I locked it because I said no latecomers. <laughs> well, by the time my parents get home from work, the answering machine is just full of angry message from the neighbors. <laughs> they are just ready to run me out of town with torches and pitchforks. And after a long night of arguing, my parents burst into my room. My mother says, that's it. We're sending you to a Bible study camp. I'm stunned. I couldn't have been more surprised if they said they were sending me to the moon. <laughs> Bible study? Why? I don't know anything about the damn Bible. <laughs> my father says, don't you swear about the <laughs> Bible. You could stand to learn a thing or two. My mother says, preferably two. <laughs> we 
When my father leaves the room, my mother says, not a word of this ends up in your act. <laughs> my mother is constantly accusing me of plotting some sort of nightclub act to embarrass her. We have this conversation all the time. I say, what act? I'm 11, I don't have an act. But you're going to. <laughs> Someday, you're gonna get on stage and tell people how crazy we were. <laughs> Who would wanna see that? People! <laughs> what people? People who need people? <laughs> My mother would say, good one. I never should have taken you to see Funny Girl when you were six. It affected you, you were too young. Let's just try to get through this week. So uh, plans are made. I perp walk through an apology tour to the neighbors. My puppets are thrown in the trash. My name is written on the back of my underwear. And as the night before I leave, I'm in my room packing. My father comes in with a handgun. He says, here, you can take this. I said, I don't know how to fire a gun. Well, maybe they'll give you some lessons. You're going in the woods, you ought to have something that shoots. Well, there's five bullets in there, just don't tell your mother. I said, I don't, I'm not gonna take this. And don't take it! I'm just trying to help you. I'm tired of trying to figure you out. The next morning, a church van picks me up. And after several hours of driving through the Santa Cruz Mountains, it dumps me in the parking lot of the Redwood Camp for Christian Youth Pre-Teen Division. The head of camp is waiting for me. Cheese and crackers, you're a tall feller. Welcome to camp. Here is your very own Bible and an abridged for appropriate pre-teen content. Let's go meet your cabin. And we walk through camp and we come to our cabin just basically like, you know, a wood shack, a, Five bunk beds, a semi-separate quarters for the counselor, kind of an outhouse-looking latrine. And one kid is reading Water Shift Down. Another is passing around a pet rock. The carpenters are playing from the digital clock radio. I think that's cool. And then I meet my counselor, Paco. Keith Partridge, haircut, he's 19, Serafi, Birkenstocks, guitar. And he is the hairiest person I have ever seen. He is literally covered in hair. He is a human hair blanket. I am instantly in love. Let me just say that, listen, listen. I like camp, I like everything about it. I like the hikes, I like the food, I like the the, you know, the, the singing, I, I, the Bible stories, I, I like it all. Everybody is nice, which makes for a nice change. But the thing I like most about, champ, about camp is the quiet at night. Real quiet, not just uneasy silence in the dark, but real quiet, I sleep. I really sleep. Well, all the afternoon activities at camp are already full up. Uh, except for arts and crafts, and everybody knows arts and crafts are for losers. I take the only seat available next to a kid named Louie, who is putting glue on dried macaroni and eating it. He offers me some, I take it, it's not terrible. And my eyes glance over this large table of arts and crafts things, uh, paint, uh, mm, yarn. Googly eyes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Who cares? Oh, old socks. Oh, gross. And then it hits me. Socks, yarn, paint, googly eyes. I can make sock puppets. I can make exorcist sock puppets. <laughs> I work furiously. And finally, finally, my sock puppets are finished even greater than before. My possessed girl puppet and my priest puppet, and I put them on. At last, my arms are complete again! Jump 
skip ahead a few days. We're on a hike. And some of the girls from the girls' side of the camp have joined us. Well, we're in a very foggy part of the forest, and one girl and one boy fall down a really steep hill. <laughs> and then Paco falls down the hill trying to help them. Be careful, Paco! Well, it turns out that the boy has a sprained ankle and cannot walk, and the girl maybe has a broken foot and needs immediate medical attention. So Paco decides that he's gonna carry her back to the camp. And he tells the rest of us to stay with the boy with a sprained ankle who can't walk until he gets back with more adults. I say, well, what do you want us to do while we're waiting? He says, tell a Bible story. <laughs> but what I hear is tell a story that involves the Bible. Two priests and a girl possessed by the devil. As soon as Paco is out of sight, I say, get around, kitties! It's showtime! Well, I think the show goes great. <laughs> but an hour later, I find myself in the office of the head of camp. What in the peanut butter and jelly made you think you could put on a dirty bummet show? And don't you tell me it was a chimney hee haw devil. The devil is horse bucky. The devil is horse bucky. I've got a whole cabin full of kids with a cheese and scared out of them. Sunny Beach. I have never had to send a kid home early from camp. But I'm calling your poor parents right now. Am I supposed to be afraid of this guy? Are you kidding? If you're not hitting me on the back of the head with an empty bourbon bottle, you're not playing in my league. <laughs> and my mother is no fool. She knew something was gonna go wrong. She tells me later she spent the whole week avoiding picking up the telephone. <laughs> she hears the message, she waits an hour, she puts on a mariachi record, she calls back and says, we can't come get him, we're in Mexico, <laughs> click. So I, I, I'm placed on a cabin arrest for the rest of the week. Now, this is my first official incarceration. And uh, I really, I don't know what to make of it. On the first day when all the kids get up and they go to breakfast and I'm left behind, I'm, I'm really mad. But then a lady from the cafeteria comes with a huge tray of food. And I like, get back into my bunk and I eat toast and I think, this is not terrible. <laughs> and then when everybody leaves for the big hike and Bible study, I do what anyone in my situation would do. I searched their luggage. <laughs> I moved everybody's underwear around. I ate all their hidden candy. And then I settled in and I read all of their mail. I read all the letters from home. I read their diaries, everything. And when I was done, I, I had, you know, a, an epiphany that, well, I like these Bible study kids. I was never going to be one of them. I'm just too... Different. I'm different. I've seen too many things. I know too much. I will never fit in. I will never fit in with the kids at school. I will always be one of the people on the fringes. That's where I live. So on the last night of the, of the camp, they say that I can go to the big final bonfire uh, where there's like, you know, I'm sitting by myself up at the top and there's songs and there's stories like there are every night. And then something unusual happens. One of the counselors asked if anyone would like to get up and speak. And a feeling comes over me, a whole body sensation I can only describe as possession. And I stand up and I say, I've got something to say. And I run down to the front and I grab the microphone and miraculously nobody tries to take it from me. I say, behold me. For I have had an amazing transformation this week at camp. Before I came here, I was consorting with the devil. 
I asked the devil to come into my life. I saw his head spin around. I tried to call him with a Ouija board. I even invited him into my own two hands to speak through me. Because I believe the devil could cure me of being the class weirdo. But now, because of the miracle of camp, and especially Paco, I know that weird is good. Different is special. Yes, I'm a weirdo. But I like it. I like it. I like it. When I grow up, I'm gonna live. And this little light of mine is going to shine. And now I'm gonna get the devil out of all of you. We're gonna have an exorcism right now. When I say the devil is, you're gonna shout, Horse Punky, the devil is! The devil is! The devil is! We are all here! Not everybody. Thank you. The devil is, the devil is, the devil is James Judd. Snap Nation, James Judd, backed by the amazing Bells Atlas, who just happened to have a brand new album out. It's called The Mystic, and you're going to want to get it to get into the groove. Bellsatlas.com. Hey, this is Sandra from Bells Atlas, and this is our new single, Belly. The show is produced by myself and the Uber producer himself, Mr. Mark to the Wristage. And even though this is this is not the news, friends, no way is this the news. In fact, someone may try to trick you into skipping around a satanic dance ritual. Even then, you should know that you would not be, in that case, as far away from the news as this is. But this is P.R. Thanks. 